Hello, everybody. It is your girl, Lauren Ree, right here from the Lauren Ree Live Show. I am reporting to you guys live from a secret location. <laughs> on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I am in um, the beautiful Miami, Florida right now on a little bit of a vacation, but duty still calls. So, Jay, what's up? Uh, I'm chilling. I'm good. Good weekend. Good week. Very busy. Very excited for yeah. today's show. Today's guest. I uh, am very, too. It's very, it's very. Uh, it's like um, this doesn't really happen when we have someone representing the fourth estate. Like this is going to be a lot of fun because um, this person that we're about to bring on very shortly has an amazing career. She does a great job here in Philly, um, and I'm excited. Dude, she's an Emmy winner. Yeah, that's crazy. We've never, we've never had an Emmy winner on the show. This yeah. Checkbox, checkbox, right? Step yeah. y'all game up. Step y'all game yeah. up. Okay. <laughs> Step it get up. The, get the, get that hardware <laughs> up. You know what I mean? But without right. further ado, we're gonna uh, bring in a journalist from uh, ABC ABC Six News. Um, she shows the Water Ice page a lot of love. Uh, so uh, we're de definitely grateful that she's here. I know she's busy. But without further ado, here's Christina Aletto. Hi guys, how are you? Good. How are you today? Doing great. Doing great. Doing well. Trying to stay dry. I don't have the Miami background, <laughs> unlike you, but. <laughs> I know us pe peasants over here in Philly, it's just raining right? and cold. Stop it. Stop it. Stop, stop, stop. It was actually stop. my idea. It was actually my idea to flaw. Be so very clear. Idea. I was like, I'll just go like to the cafe or something or a Starbucks or whatever. Jay like, no, I had to back, have the beach background. And I'm just like, I know. all right. She's out here stunting and the rest of us are trapped in our house because well, we it's make raining do. outside but okay. <laughs> we may do but christina thank you so much for joining yes, us thank you um, very excited to have you on how's everything going um yeah i mean it's going well just really busy i uh, can't believe that we're still in this pandemic and still working in the pandemic yeah. um which has been quite a challenge but i think i'm sure as you guys know that being adaptable is the most important thing to survival especially in our industry so absolutely uh yeah i'm just trying to ride the wave out <laughs> So that, you know what, let's just start there. Like, how has it been? I mean, it's, the world has just been different for everyone, but um, you're you're actually on the news. So how has the pandemic really impacted you? And how did you were able to, you know, make the change? Honestly, it was really, really hard. I think for everyone, it was pretty hard, especially like I do both. I report and I anchor. And so I was on maternity leave when the world was shutting down. And as wow. I was coming back, I got you know, my job said, hey, you know, things are a little different from the last time you were here. Um, you're not gonna be allowed to come inside. You have to stay outside and um, you're gonna work with the same person every day. And we're telling, you know, we're going out to do our interviews very differently. A lot of them are by Zoom. Some of them are in person. And we think it's just gonna be for a couple of weeks, which we, you know, obviously found out that was not the case. <laughs> and right. <laughs> and then you know, they're like, but it'll be okay. And you'll be able to come back in and da, 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 da. And I was like, okay. Um, I had been basically trapped in my house the whole time. And not because of the pandemic, but just because I had a newborn and I didn't really go anywhere. So for me, I was like, I'm getting out. I didn't do hardly any of my interviews mm. via Zoom. I was out there in person doing everything. They had like six foot poles that we used to do everything with. Mm -hmm. And initially I would do those interviews like that. And then I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to be smart mask up, constantly sanitizing my hands, constantly washing my hands. And I'm just going to do how I normally do everything because, you know, I, it's, it's very hard to feel natural like this. When yeah. You're doing an interview. <laughs> but I know your arms got, got really built. <laughs> they, they got Listen, cut from holding that heavy I'm trying mic. to get those Melissa McGee arms. That's what I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to do that. I'm, she's like my inspiration. But yeah, so that was kind of how we started. And I kind of just do things the way I would normally do with the exception of, you know, certain situations I'm in, I keep a distance, obviously. I don't go inside to people's homes mm -hmm. anymore. I don't really do anything indoors unless I have to. And then if it's a point where you do need to have like this, you know, the pole, what we've started doing is you do a mic stand and we'll set it and we'll have the person walk up and we'll walk away. And that's kind of how, that's cool. which is a lot. Yeah. It's like so much easier because yeah. at least that way I'm not doing <laughs> that which is just could you imagine trying to talk to people at crime scenes no. like hey no. we, we, listen, heck, to, heck, heck wanted me to go back to the the man in the streets and i'm like i'm not gonna hold this pole while i'm struggling for right you know, trying to ask these questions and i'm like you shaking. So are. 
hard. Like it's, it's hard. So, so hard. we just, we kind of. It's just not that. natural. It's because, not. Because you also like, when you're going up to people, you don't want to seem like you need something from them. I mean, you obviously do need something from them, but at the same right. time, you want it to be conversational. You want them to feel comfortable. And there's nothing comfortable about like. Because then they're, like, they're, kinda, okay? they're looking at you like, are you okay? Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> you've got this thing on, you're like, how do you feel? You're, and you're like, uh, bruh, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. Like, it's out of my face. <laughs> so before, I mean, I don't want to talk about the pandemic too much, but I'm just curious because I know when, um, obviously before quarantine with us, we were doing weekly roundups of just news stories, trending topics, and we would drop it every week. Yeah, and I remember vividly like December, November of, you know, this word coronavirus or there's a pandemic going on in China. We didn't really know, but I just remember every week it was just like the numbers kept getting bigger. There was more countries affected. And I remember having these these conversations with Hector, like, do you think this is going to be like a, you know, one of those things where, you know, it's going to be a worldwide phenomena. And as the weeks went on, you're like, yep, 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 yep. So was that kind of like how, um, I guess, in with you hearing about this story, was that kind of like this, a similar thing where it was just like, ah, nothing's going to happen or maybe it's just over there. And then like as the weeks went on, it started to gradually be a yeah. big thing. Oh my God. And also, and I, and I have to again, like remind you guys, I was on maternity leave. Right. So I wasn't even watching the news. I had no idea what was wow. going on. And wow. my husband had gone back to work after fraternity leave and said, oh my God, I don't know if you're going to be going back the same way. And I was like, no, it's fine. I was like, it's the flu. Right. Yeah. Right. And then That's when I got we back to saying. work, right. And then when I got back to work and I was getting all the information that like most news agencies get, it was like constantly changing and being updated. I was like, oh no, this, this is real. This is real. This is real life. And oh, so that cool. was when I really understood the gravity of what was going on. But I was definitely in that ignorant camp of just like, da, 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 it's the flu. Yeah, we'll be fine. You'll be yeah. all right, right? Here we are, what, um, a whole day, year later. Yeah, vaccine, day 400. Vaccines um, and everything. So really quick, you just, you said it twice. You were out on maternity leave. So congratulations. Absolutely. Oh, um, is the baby like one now? Around She's one? She's 15 now? months. She's 15 wow, months. Wow, good. She's more than half my height. <laughs> <laughs> Which let me just preface, I'm like very petite. My husband is incredibly tall, but having somebody that's more like literally 33 inches and like, what is going on with my life? She's already sizing I can't you even up. <laughs> Yeah, just like, I'm not doing that. What? <laughs> First of all, how do you how are you talking? <laughs> right. How are you even like oh my god, I can't. Well, she doesn't talk, but she does say a couple words, but it's more so her attitude. She's very feisty. She's telling you, like, nah, we're not right. doing that right now, right? <laughs> Which I I mean I get because like we're basically cut from the same cloth, but I'm like, uh, you can't you can't cut your eyes at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take it back a little bit. So when did you kind of know you wanted to get into journalism and, and, and broadcasting? Oh, when I was in second grade. Wow. That's so easy. Well, I was in second grade. They asked me what my favorite show was. And I said, the news with Dan Rather. <laughs> and awesome my parents trailer. were so shook. <laughs> my parents were so shook. They were like, she watches Full House. Like, what is she talking about? But I loved the news. I loved storytelling. And I used to interview my mom when she would come home from work. <laughs> I know it's like a true story and my oh, sister my would hold it like tired and just like yeah oh my god I would be in the laundry room I'm like oh my, my sister would hold the camcorder and I'd be like oh it's Christy Aletto in the laundry room live with my mom who just got home from work mom how was your day and she's like get that out of my face wait oh wait do you still have those videotapes though like that would be amazing I mean does anyone have VHS <laughs> it's, it's making a comeback it's making a comeback that all that all that, um, all that you know nostalgia that's all coming back so you never know that's true <laughs> that's true that is true so, so yeah so grade, that was when I got the bug so okay. second grade let's fast forward a lot so um after after college what was your like first um first job and out of college doing um news anchoring or pretty, were you just doing journalism first it's one of those things I, where, where like you have to kind of earn your keep you got you got to go to like yeah a small right. market right yeah. like yeah. there's like 200 oh people a little city that no one <laughs> ever has ever heard of wait this is wait so are you guys you're from texas yes. yeah you're from texas. i'm from, from, I'm, from, from? Philly. I'm from philly i'm from philly but well, where in texas are you from are you from like a big city san antonio okay so you're from like a pretty big city then yeah i'm from dc and went to school at northwestern in chicago and so flex. my first job what'd you say that was a flex that's a great school major oh, flex it is. well i wasn't trying to i mean Yes, but I wasn't, it was just more so like I went, 
from like one big city to the next. Sure, sure, sure. And then my first job was in Huntsville, Alabama, which is, they have a NASA site, but it's for me being from the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic region, um, this was like being a fish on a mountain. Sure. I did not understand what anybody was saying because they all sing when they speak. Yes. <laughs> and it's like a completely different culture, which by the way, I love Southern everything. My husband's from Memphis, so I'm all about like the South. However, I was like, what is going on right now? Right. I did everything. I carried a camera. I, I shot all my video. I edited. I reported. And which I'm sure you're probably familiar with. On Friday nights, does your local news do an entire football yes. newscast? Yes, I already knew okay. you were going to say that. Right? Friday, Friday Night Lights Friday is Night Lights. religion. Yes, they do not do that in D.C. I just want to say that, like, there's, like, actual real news that happens, like, in their right. rundowns. It's not, like, high school football. Right. And I remember they said to me, um, you need to go to these games, shoot it, and call these highlights. <laughs> are, you, are you a big what? sports fan? At the time, I wasn't. Like, now I'm, like, into it because okay. of my husband. But before, I was like, I don't know anything about football. I don't know how to shoot games. Like, this is not something that I know how to do. <laughs> so being the ingenue that I am, I basically just, like, got this kid. I said, I'm going to pay you $20 if you shoot this stuff. And I'll cut it. You tell me what to say. And that's how it worked. Because the first night was like a disaster. And then after this, and then the second week, I was like, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And then it was smooth sailing after that. But oh my God, it was so rough. It's pretty much like how we started here. What are I? It's like guerrilla style where you're just like, all right, I don't know how to do this. Let's find someone who's a kid who's excited. 20 bucks yeah. for an hour here. Just shoot this. Yeah. Like that's That, that yeah. kind of brings a lot of fun to it because, you know, you're, you're helping that person out, but then you're yeah. he helping you out because you don't have and to you're worry. you're learning at the same time. Right. He was learning because he was in college and he wanted to do the same thing. And I was like, I'm just really not trying to fail at these right. <laughs> sports highlights. They just <laughs> tell me what to say. Before, yes. before I, I, I'm glad you bring to that because we, we, we hardly ever talk about football, especially high school football, because I don't think, I don't think Lauren understands the gravity of how big high school football is are in, um is in those small cities in the south oh my in god the south like it's the whole town leaves I, to go I'm to about the to say, like i know everybody from, there like, i know from like movies and stuff how everyone packs up and it's, goes to the game it's nothing but it's so experience. different until you actually yeah i was about to say until you can see it where you actually see parents that are like during practices right during, yes. like what on like yes. monday through thursday like the practices after school there are parents that are you know tailgating at the practice and they're like do you have anything better to do no than tailgate they, right they now? work they work <laughs> they go see their kids practice some of them don't even have kids they just like they, they, just they were know. alumni from yeah. you know 20 years ago and they just they just know every kid they they grow up everybody grows up in the same town and mm -hmm. friday and friday night there's 12,000 people yeah. at, a, at a high school football game. Right. Is, and yeah. you're like, where's, where is everybody during the day? I just want right. to know, like, how come I don't <laughs> right. ever see 12,000 people except ever, for anywhere. when I go, to, when I would go to like the Walmart. That's yeah. the only time, every time I saw it was like packed. It was like that. I always thought outside. it was, I always thought it was college football that everyone was like fanatical about. Well, they, where well, they are, especially they are. in Alabama, like the yeah. iron bowl for sure. But like Friday nights in these local, not even municipalities, these towns, towns, <laughs> town sometimes the cows have there's more cows yes. in town than people like I'm not, I'm not even joking yeah like, just thousand people somehow there's twelve thousand people at this game you're just like where <laughs> yeah i'm i'm way too city for that i would be like <laughs> what so how long yeah. did you survive in this town in Al in alabama i was there for like a year and a half so i wasn't even there that long but i will okay. say at the time i was like miserable but looking back, I absolutely loved my experience there because there was a lot of professional, but most importantly, personal growth. Sure. Okay. And I think that was where I kind of learned how to interact with people that I didn't necessarily see eye to eye with, but like there was a, a, an acquired mutual understanding and respect. And I think that really helped me throughout the rest of my career of, of learning to find like common ground and relating to the people who I wouldn't otherwise associate myself with. I was gonna say, right. you seem to be a very strong woman just in general, but do you think that process or that experience made you stronger when it was time for you to move on to bigger and better things and how you communicated and how you just interacted with uh, people in general, especially on a bigger platform? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because there were so many, I, I genuinely felt so out of place there the entire time that I was there. But I learned with each story, with each person and relationship with a source that I developed, that there were things that I had in common with each of these individuals that I wouldn't necessarily know unless I actually took the time to get to know those people. And so that I think that's what really helped me going forward, because now it's so easy for me to find things in common with people that I wouldn't necessarily, you know, interact with very quick, very quickly versus like when I was in Alabama, it would take me time. But I think that's part of the growing process. And now I can find stuff in common and like talk to anybody, which I don't think I would have really had, you know, that opportunity to do unless I had gone to yeah, I mean, um, you know, when people watch the news, they want to make they they want to be able to watch someone who is relatable and who can talk to uh, people and just it, it's genuine, right? So, from did you go to? Were you in New Mexico after Alabama? Yes. How was that? Yeah, experience? I actually really I liked it and I didn't like it. Okay, so I didn't like it because it was very very far from where I'm from, and sure. that was I got homesick a lot, and it wasn't easy to get from Albuquerque back to DC. But at the same time, it was a beautiful state. I don't think I'll ever get another opportunity to live in the desert. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a minority majority state too. So I learned a lot about like the Native American Indians. Obviously, when I say minority majority, I mean, there are a lot of Latinos there okay. in New Mexico. And it's actually like a really cool place. It's a hidden gem that I, I feel like most people wouldn't like they kind of sleep on New Mexico. And then when you go there, you're like, oh, I really, I don't know why everyone likes it. Yeah, I feel like there's a, there's like a renaissance, especially during the, like the pandemic. A lot of people wanted to go visit Arizona and Mexico because it's like wide open spaces. So I think it's definitely making a renaissance like nowadays. Listen, the best time to go there is the first two weeks of October because they have this thing called the International Balloon Fiesta. Mm. A hot okay. air balloon festival. Oh, that's cool. That's what they're known for. And it is so cool. And also, I had no idea that it was a mile above sea level. So it's just like Denver. Right, right. So, wow. I mean, there's so many cool things about that place. But if you're an outdoors person, that's really the place for you. I'm not an outdoors person. So I was <laughs> like, eh, this may not be my last. <laughs> so you've cut, like, from my research, you've covered, like, a lot of hard-hitting topics um, during your career one in which you um, covered the Freddie Gray story. Um, I, I don't remember the year it actually was, but um, you you covered a lot of that, like on the ground covering it. How did those like really hard hitting stories, especially um, in this climate that we are with a lot of racial tension, um, how did that impact you in your, your work in journalism? Um, okay, so first that happened in 2015 mm -hmm. and Honestly, I will, I, I, I kind of think I didn't ever really process what had happened until this past year. And I was still, I think, dealing with a lot of stuff that I had experienced while covering that. Mm -hmm. I also think that when I got into Baltimore, I started covering a lot of these crime stories. There really wasn't a lot of crime in Alabama and New Mexico. Right. And also a lot of clashes with police between like police and black and brown communities in the inner city I hadn't really understood the gravity of where that stemmed from until I started covering these stories I started talking to people and I think part of that is just like me being oblivious and ignorant to like what was happening to people like me but then at the same time I was you know grateful to be able to process all of that but it was so hard when you're in it mm -hmm. right because you cover this gentleman who died in, he got, he was critically injured while in police custody because he was handcuffed. And then the officer took him on what they call like a rough ride to the jail. And he had 80% of his spinal cord severed. Correct. It took him to Maryland shock trauma. He was on life support for a couple of days and then he passed away. And I remember it was like April 25th, 2015. It was a Saturday. There were some protests and then an unrest happened by the inner harbor during a Baltimore Orioles game. And I had gotten called into work and I remember like, wow, this is crazy. Cause I covered protests the whole I week, remember that. but I didn't think that it had like, I didn't think it was going to get like that. And I was like, okay. And then the next day was his funeral and 
the police department, even his family was like, don't do, you know, please don't do anything. Da, 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 da. And then I remember getting the call on Monday. They're like, can you come in early? And I've just to preface, I was living with my parents in Silver Spring, Maryland and commuting to Baltimore. So I didn't live in the city at the time. And I was like, okay, well, I'm on my way, but I'm not going to be there any like earlier than I normally am. And they're like, we need to go to Mondalmin Mall, which is like this mall in the city. And it's a big transportation hub where a lot of kids get dumped off or they catch the train or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, they, these kids, these high school kids are gonna have like some sort of protest starting from Mondawmin Mall to like, I think it was Penn and North, which was the intersection. And I was like, okay. And we get there and you just see all of these helicopters flying and you see all of these officers um, with batons and some of them have shields, but most of them aren't in like full riot gear. And I'm looking around and you see all these police, they're doing like these, formations and then you see these kids that have backpacks I'm like why are they so militarized and these kids like they don't have anything and then all of a sudden and, and obviously the whole week the tensions had just been like brewing 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 yeah. you see like one rock fly across the street followed by like five more followed by like 15 more and it just like keeps coming and coming you're like okay well now it's happening and yeah. we're up we're live and it's just let's just go and that was a good 10 hours of being on air of just all of that that's nonstop. Insane. So it was just, too crazy. I can't imagine. And you're saying that you actually just started to get to process it really this year. Is that because you've been still for a year and it's like more so being able to really kind of like think about it and think what you were actually in the midst of or or is it just that it just came on that you were able to, to really process what was happening? I think like I, I never really processed what had happened because I just I remember a couple weeks afterwards, I was talking to my sister and I was like, I feel really angry and I don't know why. And she's like, I think it was because you were in a riot and you got maced. And I was like, maybe. And she's wow. like, you should probably see somebody. And I was like, yeah. And I never did. And then like life happened, right? I left Baltimore, I moved to Philadelphia. Then like the next year I got engaged, I got married. And it was just like, okay, cool. Like, da, 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 like push yeah. that down. Like sure. Suppress it's out of sight, out of mind. I mean, I'm still Absolutely. covering stories, right? That are like, right. that could easily pop off to something like that here in Philadelphia, but it's it's not. It's just like, duh, 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 I'm going off my life, going off my life. Then I have a baby and then this happens. So now like, I'm still emotional, right? I'm right. still emotional from all the hormones of being pregnant, which by the way, I'll also preface, I didn't mention this, like I was going through postpartum depression wow. when I came mm. back to work. So I think a lot of that, like it all hit me at the same time when the George Floyd mm. stuff happened. And then I'm trying to process like, that could have been my husband. That could have been somebody that I know. What kind of world am I living in? Also like our building was looted. So I heard all of it and my daughter woke up. So I was like, could this have been my child? Like just, you start thinking about like all these things and you start putting yourself in those situations. Like, could this have been me? Wow. And I think that was when I was like, oh, I need to, I need to like let this sink in. And I also think I need to talk to somebody about just everything that's going on. Which by the way, I will say like having, being healthy up here and here is just as important as being like physically healthy. Sure. I was, we don't talk I was, about that a lot. I was just about to ask you if you were comfortable talking about it. Like how important was it once you got the opportunity to sit and talk with someone um, for you to kind of be able to release um, all of that, you know, not just the, the hard hitting stuff, but you've been kind of working around the clock since you've kind of gotten out of school and then life, like you said, you got married and you yeah. got engaged, got married, mo you've moved three times, had like how much, <laughs> had a baby, um, how, you know, how relieving was for, of that? Because I always talk about mental health. Um, this vacation is for a mental health reason. I just needed to get away from everything that was happening. You know, it's a lot of crime going on in Philly right now. Like, and you're still in a pandemic. So you're afraid to go outside because you don't know if, you're going to go to the wrong place at the wrong time and then it's COVID. So it's just a lot. So once you were able to sit and talk with someone, like how did that really feel for you to be able to act finally be able to real lift that brick off of your shoulders? Yeah. Lauren, it was a release. And, yeah. and I know a lot of people in our community kind of sleep on like yeah. talking to somebody or whatever. And like, mm -hmm. for me, it was a bunch of things. Like you said, it wasn't just like, Oh, it was a bunch of stories or it was this, that and the other. I mean, I was mourning the death of my old life, just being able to YOLO it up, okay? So there was that. There was right. like the world shut down. I'm now having to take care of a tiny person who I absolutely adore, but that's a lot. 
and then work and just it's a whole bunch of stuff and I was like I need to talk to somebody and I need to do it now and I but I didn't I didn't realize that I needed to do that until I started covering the unrest here like that's how long it took me and I've been back at work since March 30th or 31st of last year and it took me until June which is when all that stuff popped off here for me to be like oh I need I need to do that and the thing is, most importantly, like for me to be a good wife, a good employee and a good mother, I need to be like good here. <laughs> so like, yes. You have to be good emotionally and mentally. And when you're just like always feeling a certain way and you're just like jitters and anxiety, then you need to like talk to somebody. And and it's, you know, what you do, especially being out there in the field, um, you know, you, you see stories of, you know, reporters and journalists getting like maced or whatever as well like that's got to be scary too because you're out here just trying to do your job and you know you're trying to stay safe you're 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 almost like a, an animal that's like you know the surroundings you know you're just trying right. to like keep your head on the swivel so then you add that element of danger when you're out there yeah. trying to report the news on top of everything and then you gotta come like right. gotta do another 12 hours the next day or whatever like that's a lot i don't think people really understand how much <laughs> how, how, how crazy that is it is a lot. It's definitely a lot because there are some nights where you do longer than your eight hour shift, which is fine. But there are days when it's like that. I also think here, like at our station, we definitely do a really good job of not trying to put ourselves in the middle of everything to the point where our safety is at risk. Right. Um, yeah. So I feel like that's really good that we do that. And then also like we know the police here. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I see these people out sadly at crime scenes all the time. So it's one of those things where like, you know, who's going to be at these scenes and if, you know, if they're like, Hey, it's not good. Like you got to back up. Then that's what you do. You're just like, okay, cool. Like wherever I need to stand is where I'm going to stand where you tell me to stand wherever that's the safest place. Is, that's where I'm going to go. So. so, so balance is really important. And how are you able to separate um, the story from the personal part of your life? Because you're um, covering these stories that could, like you said, like that person could have been my husband. I could have known someone who got maced. I got maced. How do you, um, when you're doing these stories of unrest in the city and or covering things like um, Freddie Gray or just like different things that have happened in the city here, how do you balance the two and how do you separate it from your personal life versus your professional life? I will say pre-baby, I did a really good job of compartmentalizing. I think this year, this past year was a little bit more challenging just because I'm looking at something, I'm looking at a lot of these stories through a different lens, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not just looking at it as, oh, I'm, a, you know, I'm Christy Oletto, da, 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 da. It's like, I'm, now I'm looking at it as I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at a lot of these incidents as a parent first, and then I'm looking at it as just a taxpayer. And so I think what's been really important for me is that when I come home, like I literally log off unless it's like TikTok or Instagram <laughs> because I just can't, like, I don't watch the news unless, but I'm still informed. I just don't watch it because I, I need to like separate that part of my life from my current personal life. So we don't really do that. I don't get on like Twitter, Facebook, which I don't really like Facebook. Um, but yeah, I just stay right. I just can't like, I don't even know why people are on it anymore. Do you remember when it used to just be for people out in college? Like what yo, happened? Yo, I talk about like, I sound like such a, I'm like, get off my lawn. I'm, I sound so old. Cause I'm just like, remember it was just people in college and you just like, drew no, you, you, had have have college, you had to have a college, you had to have a college ID to get a, a college a, email, email. You yeah. A college email. It had to be like that, 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 that dot edu at temple yep. or whatever like yeah right. that was that was amazing yeah it, now it's like everybody has a PhD everybody has in political it. science yeah. and right have you know opinions that are facts like it's just it's a it. it's a dating yeah. app now <laughs> it's a dating <laughs> app it is like i keep getting this ad for like facebook dating like we're like we won't match you with any of your friends and i'm like nah but you're gonna match me with one of my friends of a friend and i'm not <laughs> i'm good not about that life not about the life yeah so um but yeah, I get it. So you basically, un you cut everything off when you kind of, you come in the house. That's dope. Yeah. I unplug and then my child and I will just do TikTok videos. <laughs> Fun. Fun. So um, why do you think it's important for um, women of color to hold these spaces in journalism? They like to, you know, to tell the story. Uh, 
I was just having a conversation about that with the kids at Vox a couple of days ago. It is so important, especially now more than ever. And I think our voices are so critical and needed, right? Because think about this, like a couple of years was Me Too. And then just last year was George Floyd. And so now like people want, they like, we always knew that our voices were needed, but now people are really like making concerted effort to make sure that we have a seat at the table right. and that our voices are amplified with a megaphone. And so I think it's important, especially in news, because you want to be able to represent all of the people that are watching and not just a certain group. And I, and you know, my experience is different from your experience, which is different from somebody else's experience. And so when you're coming like, hey, I think this is a good story. Like we pitch stories in our um, editorial meetings. And I think that's where like my voice is heard the most is where I say, hey, I think this is a good story. I would like to do this one over doing this because this is a big deal in this community. For instance, um, Shania, Shania, that was her name. A couple weeks, actually it was like a month ago. She is a West Philadelphia senior who goes to George Washington Carver. And she got a million dollars in scholarships. Scholarships, yeah. Oh my God. I trying to get her, trying to get her on the show. <laughs> oh, I, I have contact information. I will send that to you. Okay. I literally was trolling Instagram, like with Clark, which is, that's my daughter. We're just trolling. Da, 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 da. And I was like, is this real? So that's I cool. messaged the person that posted it, which happened to be her aunt. And we started talking. I was like, listen, I'm going to pitch this story in our 3 p.m. editorial meeting. If we get the green light, do you think she'll talk? And she's like, yeah, oh my God, da, da, da. I was like, okay, great. So I like typed up this whole, like, this is why this is important. Like, this is like unheard of. I can't, like, I didn't get a million dollars in scholarships. I think I got like one scholarship for a thousand dollars. I don't think, I didn't <laughs> think that was possible to get a million dollars right? in scholarship. That's insane. Yeah. But she also applied to 18 schools, but that's a lot of money. Yeah. And that's amazing. So they were like, in our editorial meeting, they're like, yeah, Christy, if you want to do the story, go for it. That's fine. So I was like, yes, we're going to do the story. It literally goes viral on our um, website. It gets picked up by GMA. It gets picked up by ABC News. Yeah. She's on People, CNN. And, which I don't want to spill the beans, but I will just say she flew out to Hollywood this past week to do a show, which will air next month. I I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, because it was all over her Instagram. (laughs) Yeah. I, I mean... I, I I saw her on a lot of publications, but the first one I talk I saw her on was the Shade Room actually, and I'm okay. reading and I'm reading I'm reading the caption, and they were like filled up, and I was like, where is this girl? I have to find it. I have to find this girl. She has to be on the show, and I was like, this is just so dope. This is amazing. But because you you have that platform and you're in your position, you're able to tell these stories, and and again, yeah. that's why it's so important for us to be in these spaces. Because I want people, and I mean, the thing is, is like anybody could have gotten that, but it's like a huge deal for someone like her to have gotten that because she lives in the inner city. She goes to a Philadelphia public school, which I'm not, I'm not knocking Philadelphia public schools. But what I'm saying is, is we know that it's no secret that there are a lot of challenges and hurdles for a lot of students I'll knock, the it. Past it's, year. I'll knock it it's trash <laughs> like, I'll say it well, I'm not gonna say that but <laughs> yeah, I will say it. it's there have been a lot of hurdles especially this past year because of virtual learning sure. and you know that whole like wi-fi situation and it impacts it negatively impacts a lot of communities of color particularly students of color and Correct. so for her to have achieved what she achieved not only in her school but then to have applied to 18 colleges and gotten over a million dollars in scholarship funds is amazing. Yeah. Shout out to her family and her guidance counselors. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a ton ton of work. One of my best friend's daughter is going to college next year. And every every other week, she's like, Lauren, I need you to write me another recommend uh, for a grant or whatever. And I'm like, well, because she's applied also to like 12 schools. And her mom is like, you gotta get, gotta be where the money resides. We gotta get this money because college is expensive now. Yo, it is crazy. More and more every year. Wait, like real talk, Northwestern, I think is like seventy grand right now. Yeah, yeah. So like she that's in, someone's salary. But what is that going she, on? She got into University of Miami, and they didn't really that's give awesome. her it. She didn't. That was her second choice. She got into her second choice. And they really didn't give her any scholarship. They gave her some, but it's $65,000 a year. 
That's crazy. See, like that's so wild. And you don't want to come out of school with debt unless you have to. It's almost you know what impossible. I mean? <laughs> it's almost impossible. That's what I'm is. saying. Like, so it's just, that's, yeah, it's so hard. It's so hard. And then you don't want to be like graduating with debt. And then it's like, it's set you back compared right. to like your peers. And so I get it. I get it. I uh, I mean, we're talking about representation and um, I don't know if it's cool, but I mean, you have it on your, on your, um, you know, your description page and whatnot. Uh, you're black and Filipino. Is that correct? Oh yeah. I'm Blasian. Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm also biracial too. And I just wanted to kind of like pick your brain as far as like growing up, did you ever feel left out in certain like circles, whether you're, did you ever feel like, Oh, I'm not black enough or I'm not, you know, Filipino enough or whatever. And did, did those experiences kind of push you forward to really uh, put yourself in a position of representation? Um, absolutely. So I actually did an IG live chat on um, our station Instagram during the DNC because, as you know, Kamala is also Black and Asian, Indian yes. American being Asian American. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I feel so represented right now because right. it's just such, honestly, like I look at her and I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is me. This is Clark. This is my daughter. And growing up, like I obviously didn't have the same experiences as she did, but I do know like when I was in school, people used to think that my dad really wasn't my dad because we don't look alike. Mm -hmm. And people used to say, oh, I thought you were just black with good hair. What? <laughs> That's so effing offensive. So like offensive. what? Right. And um, I only, I went to um, a Catholic school basically from like fifth grade to my senior year of high school. And my sister and I, I, like I said, I grew up in the DC area and mm. the area that we grew up in was very diverse. But in our school, we were in our middle school, we were one of two minority families. Mm. And then in my high school, there were minorities, but it wasn't as diverse as like a public school in that area would have been. Mm -hmm. And so I always, and I actually said this when we did our Asian American town hall last Sunday was I always wanted to have a point for my nose because I have um, the Villa Corta nose, which is my dad's family's nose. And I literally would walk around with a clothespin on my nose because I wanted to have a point. That's how insecure I was about my nose. Oh. And I used to get made fun of all the time when I was in elementary school about like my nose being big and all this stuff. And wow. I mean, now I like literally wouldn't change it because it's the only thing that makes me representative of the rest of my family. <laughs> like everyone <laughs> on my dad's side has this nose. Even my daughter has this nose. Um, so yeah, I, I used to feel like that all the time. And then I will say like, I didn't have a lot of black friends until I went to college. Like it's a true Same. story. Same. True story. So yeah, no, I, I, I had very <laughs> similar, similar experiences. Um, I would, you know, I had a fro and people always wanted to like touch it. And I'm just like, why are you in my space? Or right. they were, like my, so I'm my, my mom's side of the family is Mexican American and we're, and it's very fair skin too. So my grandpa, he was pretty much the guy that, you know, picked me up from school, practice, all that stuff. And he's very light skinned and they thought he was white. So it was like, no, he's Mexican American. It's like, how's he Mexican? How's he your grandpa? Is this? Like, it was just a whole lot of stuff. And they just assumed right. a lot of different things. And yeah. I, I, I had to act, I had to work extra hard to not be the stereotypical angry black guy or the dumb black guy, or I got to be really good at sports. I had to be really like, I had to excel at everything. It was a lot. I didn't really think about it until like, after I left, mm -hmm. like, damn, that was a lot. I was trying to please a, a lot, lot of pressure. People. Yeah, a lot of pressure. Yeah, I definitely feel that. Um, I will say though, like the good thing is, is like my family, at least on my dad's, like on both sides actually, but everyone has always been like really supportive. Mm -hmm. So I never felt like an outsider in my family. It was the only growing up that I felt outsiders in my community. Same, exactly. Yep, exactly. Because everyone was super woke about everything <laughs> especially like my cousins they were like well I remember I went to the Philippines for the first time when I was eight years old and because they're just like no black people in the Philippines right cool. so we're just walking around with my well, everybody's cousins. just staring at you aren't they? and everyone's staring at me yes so I was like Achinarine, how do you say how do you say what are you looking at in Tagalog and she was like she, she tells me what to say and I start screaming like I don't think I think I know like and these people are like oh my god she's speaking She's speaking right. to God. She knows everything we're saying. Right. It's like, yeah, yeah, come correct. I'll just, I'll just hear it. <laughs> you say come correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So um, 
when we when we end the show, we kind of uh, do um, a little bit of a game with everyone, fun stuff, okay. just to kind of like flash um, flash questions and just really quick yes or no answers, if you can okay. off the top of your head. Um, and Jay, you know the drill. So if you have anything, you know, you can add to these questions. All right. Sure. Quick hitters right. and quick hitters. Quick hitters. Quick hitters. So the other day was National Cheesesteak Day. We know you're not from Philly, but when you do Gil Sandro's. Cheese- that's it. Quick. Wow. Yeah. And why? Um, because their meat is like grounded. You know what I mean? It's so finely chopped. It's delicious. I like that. So water ice. Are you, do you get a pretzel with your water ice or do you just. <laughs> Straight up. What's your favorite flavor? Your favorite flavor. Uh, strawberry lemonade. I like that. Okay. I don't, think I, like- I, don't have, I don't think I've had that. That sounds good. That is a that is a good one. You have to like I just go to this one in the hood that's in like I think it's like Frankfurt. This photographer that I used to work with, he lit like grew up around there and he's like, Oh, you gotta go to this guy's water ice. I don't know what it's called though. I know it if it's like by like a septic hub. Okay. Um is it Sadiq's? It's in a neighborhood though. I don't know. Okay. If I go through my Instagram, I can find it because I have photos posted up outside of here eating water ice. <laughs> I got a question. Uh, yeah, so growing, I just fell off my chair. <laughs> growing, growing up in D.C., um, I'm sure, have you ever experienced Sensually like- Chili Bowl? No, I was talking about oh. Google Music. Oh, yeah. So do you have um, a, um, and, and, uh, and I guess, will you say like three words or three short phrases, your your favorite experience going to a go-go? I mean, the music, it's just not really for me. So I didn't ever okay. go to a go-go. Okay, fair enough. I feel like that was like a prerequisite growing up in DC. It was I like, mean, it is, but it's go go like and mambo it sauce. My scene. It wasn't my scene. Okay, fair enough. I could dig it. I went to Howard, so when the when the uh, go go music came on, though, you had to clear the floor. Wait, wait. Do you know like and, and when you would drive around, and this is like obviously before Sirius Radio, but when you were listening to ninety three point nine KYS or WPGC 95.5, like every night after 1130, that's when the go-go music will come on on the radio? I, I'm, and I, would, I, I assume oh, no. that that's what it was. <laughs> no, no, no I it didn't. come on the radio. It comes on the radio and then that's all they play for like literally that's, the rest of the until night. Until like 5 a.m. Yeah, wow. yeah. until sure. the Donnie Simpson show. <laughs> so, Donnie like, Simpson. I'm serious. Donnie Simpson show. Donnie, Donnie Simpson. Show. Oh my God! Donnie that was... in the morning. Yo, Donnie hey. was the man. The, Donnie was the, Donnie was the man in DC. Like he was. He was. Wasn't he, he? He was the VJ on BET for a long time. Donnie Simpson. Uh, yeah, I don't no, know. No BET. Yeah, he had a, he had his own show on. Yeah, um, on BET. Yeah, he had his own show on BET for the longest time. It wasn't called the Donnie Simpson show though. It was called Soul or something, something Soul. Oh. I forget. But he's he's yeah, he's he's a legend. He interviewed yeah, he's everybody. Like, he's like big time DC radio personality, kind of like yeah. our Power ninety nine kind of thing, yes. or like your or your Tom Joyner or your Steve Harvey, Ms. like that. Patty, Miss mm-hmm. Patty, yes, yes, Patty. yeah. So it's like a really, really, really big thing. All right, last question um because we just had this debate on our last show so i well, not really debate but did you like the new coming to america or did you get a chance Wait, to watch is it? it bad that i haven't watched it <laughs> did my card get taken i think so i think so I you think still have did. time you still have time you still have time i'll let like you keep a month. Your- you got it you got a month grace to watch it before your car gets revoked is that what we'll, it is? Still, we'll let you we'll let you keep it we'll let you keep it for a little while Hot, we'll let you keep it for a little ticking. while but it's ticking. Ticking. <laughs> but it's like, let me could i could i just say though that like why remake something if it's already great right watch it like, watch it first it. watch it first really? and then i think you'll have a different outlook well, what on do it. you but, guys think I want you to go into it with no expectations Correct. of the of the first one, and look at it as them paying homage to how great the first one was. I think I think if they would have made a second one like really right after the first one, um, I think it either could have been really good or really bad. But I think it would have been really bad. But I think the fact that that's like thirty years later, it definitely um, adds to the nostal the nostalgia and. Pay, like like Lauren said, paying homage. 
And I'll just leave it at that. And I think that that alone is really dope. And the fact that the wardrobe is amazing. <laughs> that sounds like, yeah. sounds like you guys really like it. It's funny. It's fun. It was it was fun. Like I was like, I, I thought it was like a really good. Y'all they, don't judge me for not seeing this yet, though. <laughs> no, okay? we're not. That's what I said. You can keep listen. Now, if I DM you, I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna watch it right. I'm gonna watch it later tonight. <laughs> I'm just I said, if I, now if I DM you in two weeks and you tell me that you haven't watched it, then I'm going to be like, all right, turn over your cart. <laughs> <laughs> you got about two weeks. You're a probation for like a two weeks. So I know. Oh, damn. Okay. So wait, really quick. In my like, in doing my research on you, my AKA my stalking, do you still take um, ballet classes? I haven't in such a long time. Actually, when I say a long time, I mean like two years. I was like, but okay, yeah, AKA Misty Copeland out here. Girl. I literally, I, I mean, I'm not as, I was not as good as Missy Copeland, but sometimes I'm like, could I have been like, could I have that route? And like, that is that life? <laughs> yeah, like sometimes I think about that. I'm like, maybe I could have gone that route, but I don't know. I don't think I would have made it to mm-hmm. principal. I, I three in a row. Three oh, no, actually PK and... turns were my specialty. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. See, look, so. I was like, ballet. Okay. I was like, Listen, I'm classically trained. Out. That's Classically dope. trained, Lauren. Are you going to get your daughter into it? I am definitely going to get her into it just for, in terms of, she's been walking a little weird as of late. And like, maybe ballet would help you out with just the way you're walking and standing. It's looking a little awkward. Um, but I don't know. She's so feisty and strong. So I kind of feel like she's got soccer player written all over her. Ooh. I like I'm it. definitely going to make her be a swimmer though. That's for sure. She loves water and I like to swim. So I'm going to make sure she can swim too. That's I good. actually I have it. I actually have one more question. If I can remember, oh, yeah. what it was. I think it just it just left my head. So let me think about it really quick. Yeah, think about uh, it. Oh yes, one <laughs> big misconception about me about the news media, like because oh that's a great question. I feel like there's a lot of just people shouting stuff and they're saying this like don't watch the news, blah 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 blah. blah. Like, but if we don't have the fourth estate, then we really don't have information. So what's a what's probably in your opinion the biggest misconception about uh, the news media? if you could talk about it i wouldn't well i mean i'm trying not to make it political i don't want to make it political but what i think is that what i do and the stories that i report are the truth Mm. there's nothing erroneous or fake about what i'm reporting on right I think what is most important, and I don't necessarily know misconception, but I think what is most important is that you as viewers can differentiate me and people that are on the news right. from like citizen journalists sure, who have no accountability when they right. tweet or post things because that's the difference between me and them. That's one right. of the main differences. These people can just like tweet whatever, and I want to say fun facts, but they can just tweet whatever with no repercussions on whether or not it's accurate or inaccurate. Whereas if I were to write or do anything at that caliber, that's a fireable offense. For sure. Because so I mean, I, I, I feel like they just, be, they just want to be accountability. They just want to be first and not right. Like they just like right. Def- well, not even first. It's just like how many legs can I get? How many retweets right. can I get? And it's like that's yeah. not what my job is about. My job is to like give you facts. And for you to disseminate however it is that you want to take it, whether that's like CDC says, wear a mask. I didn't tell you to wear a mask. I said, the CDC told you to wear a mask. Right. You can take that information and decide if that is good for you or if that's not good for you. But I'm not going to go anywhere beyond that. It's just CDC says, wear a mask. Take that. You're literally reporting. You're reporting the news. (laughs) (laughs) I'm reporting the news. I'm reporting a fact. That's what they said. Take it as you want. Great answer. And so I think that's the most important thing is that there is accountability for me and there's no accountability for them. Mm. That's amazing. I love it. Christy, thank you so much for joining us today. This has Um, been so fun. Yeah, we love having a lot of fun. We love having these conversations and we we were so excited when Hector told us they were like, I got Christy. And I was like, yes, let's make it happen. Let's get it done. Um, but yeah, thanks for stopping by. Um, outside of the news, um, can we look out for you anywhere, anything coming up that you're doing that you could let our viewers know about? Honestly, I'm not doing anything <laughs> that's remotely interesting outside of the music <laughs> except for like working out. 
and going to see my parents for Easter. <laughs> and creating okay. TikTok videos. And creating well, TikTok videos with my daughter. I mean, I am going back into the station um, in April. So like the second week of April to anchor again. So that's fun. Nice. But outside of that, like, no. And we, I know I'm kind of boring. We touched on it earlier, but again, congrats on your awards. Like the yes. AP and Oh my God. Thank That's you. That's pretty dope. Yes. <laughs> like real talk though, I will tell you this, even though I'm like absolutely obsessed with my husband, I got engaged and got the AP and Emmy awards, like all within a, a two month span. <laughs> and I remember wow. I told my dad, Winning. I was like, I know this was in 2016 though. And I was like, dad, I'm kind of like more excited about the Emmy awards. <laughs> The he was like, that's my girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's dope. Where can you um where can our followers um follow you like on Instagram? Oh, at Christy underscore Aletto. Excellent. And then it's the same for TikTok and the same for Twitter. And sadly I'm on Facebook. <laughs> I'm I'm like this close to really just deactivating it i'm that close but i leave it up for you know you need it for work you need it for i work. know that's why i like, have uh, it and for birthdays because <laughs> i always forget everybody's birthday true they are really good about reminding you about the people in your life <laughs> in yeah. a special day yes they are that's the only <laughs> that's the only way that i'm able to remember anyone's birthday i'm gonna be honest with you i'm like oh i get that notification on my email it says facebook is like it's such and such birthday today i'm right? like yes i won't <laughs> forget but Send that hopefully, text off. hopefully soon we get to meet in person and chop it up I in know. real life. Um, yes. So hopefully then later. But it was been great. Yeah. I, I, it was a pleasure meeting you. It was yes, so it great was. to meet you guys too. Thank you so much. And have so much fun, Lauren. I'm so jealous of where. You're yeah. <laughs> after after this, this is um I'm I'm logging off of work and then I'm for the next. Have that hot girl spring break. <laughs> Yeah, my, I'm sure my niece and nephews will not. Um, they'll be like, "Who's the lady with all the kids around her on the on the make on some the TikTok beach?" TikTok videos. Yeah, all make right. the TikTok videos. <laughs> now nah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have some family fun. We're gonna have a good time. But everyone watching the show, make sure you are following waterice.com because we are your scoop to everything Philly. Make sure you are signing up for our newsletter so you know what you guys can do. Summer is almost here, everyone. So we have some really cool stuff that is going to be coming up that we're really excited to announce to you guys um, that you're going to be able to see very, very soon. Um, also, make sure you're following the Lauren Re Live show on all social media platforms and all major streaming platforms. So that's going to be your Spotify your Apple Music, Google, um, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere YouTube. you can get a podcast, YouTube, you can um, see the Lauren Re Live show. You'll be able to see this show, actually. All right. So, Jay, you know how we end this show. Um, let's go ahead and do it. So, see you guys next week. And not all superheroes wear capes, but sometimes they wear headphones. See you guys. Have a good day. Peace.